You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Multiple anti-Pakistani establishment protests have erupted in the country and different parts of the world after Manjur Pashtin, the leader and face of the Pashtun Tahafuz movement, was arrested and slapped with charges of sedition by Pakistani law enforcement agencies. Protesters gathered in large numbers in London and Paris to extend their solidarity and demand immediate release of Pashtin. The Pashtun-led movement has exposed Pakistan's barbaric designs in northwest Waziristan, where hundreds of ethnic Pashtuns have been abducted and eliminated on the pretext of Pakistan's war on terrorism. A report. <laughs> The arrest of Manzoor Pashtin, a Pashtun leader from northwest Pakistan, has sparked widespread protests and demonstrations. And these events are not just confined to Pakistan, but the anti Pakistan slogan ring has resonated with the Pashtuns and other right groups living in different parts of the world too. They are demanding an immediate release of their leader, who was arrested on 26th January and was slapped with charges of sedition. These people accuse Pakistan government of muzzling a democratic voice of dissent that has successfully exposed the barbaric duo of civil and military rulers. This decision of the Pakistani establishment has uh, uh, provided an opportunity for the Pashtun nation uh, to be united and uh, uh, work for a common cause uh, to be released from the cruel clutches of the Punjabi uh, establishment and regime. This government of uh, Pakistan, the present government of Pakistan, uh, it's not a democracy. Uh, it is a fascism and dictatorship under complete control of the Pakistani army. They are violating uh, the, the basic fundamental rights of the Pashtun people. The arrest of Manzoor Pashtin is the latest in the line of Pakistan's reflexive response to any of dissent that gathers traction and becomes threat to its essentially autocratic rule. Manzoor Pashtin has successfully mobilized hundreds of thousands of people against the Pakistani government that has not just been treating them as second-class citizens, but has unleashed brutality against them. The movement he leads, or Pashtun Tahfuz movement, seeks justice for those who have been abducted, arrested and tried on false charges. It also demands a free and fair inquiry into the extrajudicial killings by Pakistan Army in the name of fighting terrorism in northwest Pakistan. The little list of demands seeks a full stop at the torture and humiliation they endure every day. But sadistic rulers in Islamabad are not ready to concede to even these demands, which would have not suffered even single day of delay in any other democratic part of the world. The state of Pakistan is so afraid of peaceful activists and peaceful activism in the country. Everyone who believes in the promotion and protection of fundamental human rights, everyone who believes on peace, development of the people, he is being leveled as a traitor and unpatriotic in Pakistan. The Pashtun movement, which began as a small demonstration by eight students of Gomal University, demanding removal of landmines from Waziristan, gained prominence in 2018 after Nakibullah Mahsood, a modeling aspirant, was killed in a fake encounter staged by the police officer Rao Anwar. Earlier, it was Mahsood movement, but the word was replaced with Pashtun to refer and represent all Pashtuns. Manzoor Pashtin became the face of the movement. 
The establishment was critical and made several failed attempts to nip it in the bud. After all its tactics failed, it launched a crackdown against prominent figures in the movement. The arrest of Manzoor Pashtun might have come as a blow to the months-long resistance of Pashtuns, but the movement has gained another component in the form of international audience, which will definitely see the movement from close and park brutalities from closer. Moving on. Countries across the world have announced a list of measures to prevent and confront deadly coronavirus. Most of the South Asian countries, which are in immediate vicinity of China, have barricaded the entry of Chinese nationals to their mainland and have announced a list of measures to keep the virus at bay. India has cancelled all forms of e-visas and will only allow people with compelling reasons to enter it. Administrations across the globe are sparing no efforts to fight the rapidly spreading endemic of coronavirus. While some have taken extraordinary measures to prevent its entry, others are involved in comprehensive exercises to contain its expansion. And most of them have succeeded as only two persons with infection have died outside of China. India has temporarily suspended its e-visa facility for Chinese travelers and other foreign nationals residing in mainland China. Indian Foreign Ministry spokesman Ravish Kumar told reporters in New Delhi that those having compelling reasons to visit the country have been asked to contact the Indian Embassy in Beijing. People traveling to China henceforth will be quarantined on return. Separately, travel to India from China on e-visas. They have been temporarily suspended. And uh, we have also announced that all existing e-visas are no longer valid. Similarly, the normal visa which have been issued, they are also no longer valid. India has so far successfully carried out evacuation of 640 Indian nationals and seven Maldivians on two flights from China. Airports across the world are deploying screening measures to isolate passengers with symptoms related to the disease to contain the spread of the disease. As of 7 February, the virus had entered as many as 26 countries and affected thousands. The virus has so far claimed over 600 lives, most of them from China. The World Health Organization has declared the outbreak as a global public health emergency. The U.S. also declared the outbreak as a public health emergency on 1st of February, followed by many other countries. Island nation Sri Lanka too has evacuated its citizens. Families of Sri Lankan students who were evacuated from Wuhan joined a candlelight vigil to pray for a quick end to the coronavirus threat in Colombo. Lokain, Itama, the Ikman in Turan, Veva, Pratana, Kirimata, Tamai, May Adistan, Aloka Pujava, other Api Sangidani Kale. Students in Himalayan country of Nepal were seen wearing masks, a step taken by authorities to prevent the spreading of the virus. Nepal is one of the last countries to join China's flagship Belt and Road Initiative, but has sealed its border with the country following the virus outbreak. The World Health Organization has made several recommendations for all countries to prevent and limit the further spread of the virus and keeping a check on the entries through border stops the list.
moving on many afghans and critics grew hopeful last month as peace appeared looming after taliban in its reportedly generous plan was about to declare an experimental ceasefire with us military and had even thought of holding talks with the kabul establishment however in reality the situation has not moved an inch with us confirming that there is a lot left in the talks and the two sides were still not on the same page President Trump on the other side has said that he was still committed to winding down US missions in Afghanistan and was hopeful of a deal getting signed soon. Months of extensive discussions between the United States and the Taliban, a number of floating assurances, but the story in Afghanistan continues to remain same. Attacks, counter-attacks, killings and collateral damages describe the fundamental story of past two decades of Afghanistan. There have been a number of occasions when the two sides were reportedly on the brink of hitting a deal. But the reality is far different from rumors as US says there's a lot left in the negotiations and it is still not in position to sign any form of commitment. U.S. Secretary of the State Mike Pompeo recently said that Taliban were not able to demonstrate the will and capacity to walk the talk and U.S. required a demonstrable evidence to move forward with the agreement. You know, we got close once before to having an agreement, uh, a piece of paper that we mutually executed and the Taliban were unable to demonstrate either their will or their capacity or both to deliver on a reduction in violence. And so what we are demanding now is demonstrable evidence of their will and capacity to reduce violence, to take down the threat so that the context of the inter-Afghan negotiations, which will indeed be that, these will be negotiations of, by and among the Afghans, to deliver peace and stability and regional security for themselves will have a context, a less violent context as the backdrop for those conversations. So we're, we're hopeful we can achieve that, but we're not there yet and work, work certainly remains. U.S. envoy Zelmek Khalilzad, who is representing Washington in talks, was earlier quoted by Afghan president office saying that his side was waiting for a clear response from the Taliban about a ceasefire. He was also quoted saying that a practical mechanism which is acceptable to the people of Afghanistan and US government was need of the hour. The outline of a peace deal is well known, with the main contours including a ceasefire, a withdrawal of US troops, the start of intra-Afghan negotiations and a pledge by the Taliban to not allow Afghan soil to be used to stage attacks against the United States. Trump, who campaigned on a promise to wind down America's endless wars, was reported last year to be planning to withdraw about half of the 14,000 U.S. forces in Afghanistan, which was suggestive and hopeful of a peace deal in the pipeline. But the president called off the talks in September after an attack killed a U.S. soldier. The talks resumed but were interrupted again in December after a suicide attack on a U.S. base outside Kabul killed two civilians. And now, as presidential election nears in the U.S., Trump has reiterated his stance of bringing back soldiers from the war-torn country. As we defend American lives, we are working to end America's wars in the Middle East, in Afghanistan. The determination and valor of our warfighters has allowed us to make tremendous progress, and peace talks are now underway. I am not looking to kill hundreds of thousands of people in Afghanistan, many of them totally innocent. 
the security situation in Afghanistan has declined from bad to worse in past few months. The Special Inspector General of Afghanistan Reconstruction released its 46th quarterly report which highlighted record levels of violence despite continued peace negotiations. Elections that were held around five months back have still not given a clear winner to the country. The economy continues to crumble and corruption is widespread. In such a scenario, Afghanistan is seemingly not restoring any peace. And with Taliban stepping up its violence, the future too doesn't give much hope to common Afghans. Moving on, bilateral relations between India and Nepal are mounting high. Decades of established cultural camaraderie between the two neighbors has been strengthened by a significant growth in trade and connectivity. Nepal's largest hydropower project, Arun 3, which is being built by assistance from India, received its financial closure. We have a report. India and Nepal inked financial closure of Arun 3, the largest hydropower project in the Himalayan nation. Built by the financial assistance from India, the 900 megawatt hydropower project is under construction at Sankhu Vasabha district of Nepal. Two banks from Nepal, one is Everest Bank and another is Nabil Bank, they have come forward, and come forward to participate as lenders for the government of this project to arrange this 7,800 crores NPR for the debt of for financing r project. Five Indian banks, State Bank of India, Punjab National Bank, Canara Bank, Exim Bank and Union of Bank of India, they are also participating in lending funds for the construction of this project. The project development agreement for construction of the dam was signed between SAPDC and Investment Board of Nepal in November 2014. The estimated cost of the project stands at 1.04 million US dollar. To be completed in five years, it will produce 4,018.87 million units of electricity annually. The project is expected to generate 3,000 jobs in the country. Financial closure does not just mean signing a check and giving them money, it means also on the ground support which Everest Bank and Nabil Bank can give them as the project is in Nepal. The banks that are in India which have come also will look towards us to ensure the monitoring of the project's upgrade, to give them the reports from the ground. Therefore, it's also a question of us gaining experience as well as being on the ground to facilitate. The total investment of the project is estimated to cross $1.6 billion, including over $156 million for the development of the transmission line. The peaking run of Reva project, Arun 3 has 3.65 hours of minimum peaking capacity, which was jointly inaugurated by Prime Ministers of India and Nepal on May 2018. A high head run of the Reva scheme with storage capacity envisaged for installation of four generating units of 225 megawatt each gives the project a total install capacity of 900 megawatt. It is being developed on a build, own, operate and transfer boot basis by Satlaj Jal Vidyut Nigam, Arun 3 Power Development Company, a joint venture of the Government of India and the Government of Himachal Pradesh. Riding high on the crest of winter in February, a splash of colors, rhythm of drum beats, vivid art and craft, music and dance, ethnic cuisines and an immersive cultural ethos. All this merged to mark the colorful festivity of one of the world's largest international craft fair, Suraj Kund. This year, International Craft Fair witnessed over thousands of people along with the participation of over 20 countries. India is a land of diversity and beautiful culture. Each year, several fairs attract numerous people from around the world. One such annual event is Suraj Kund Mela, which strives to showcase the richness of handicrafts, handlooms and traditions of India. Started in 1981 by the Haryana Tourism Department, the 34th edition of the fair also witnessed artisans from Sark nations, 
and other countries showcasing their art and handicrafts. From jewellery to toys, furniture to pottery, almost everything can be found here. This year, nearly 20 countries participated in the fair along with other states of India. Uzbekistan was chosen as the partner nation and Himachal Pradesh was selected as the theme state. This is years um, in Uzbekistan, India, partner country, uh, Suraj Kunt Mela. Um, this is a very nice festival. This uh, I am selling dresses, fabrics and handicraft. I have been coming to Suraj Kunt for past 15 years if not less. And I absolutely love the vibe and I choose particularly a weekday like a Monday to come here because you don't see too much crowd but even if you see on Monday, thousands of people are here. It's the best event of the year to see your culture, uh, to, to see your India in one platform. Several countries like Egypt, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and South Africa have put up their stalls and earned a good business. South Africa has been participating in the Mega Fair for a very long time. It's been seven years since African craftsmen have been coming here and displaying their beautiful arts and crafts. Yes, I think it's the best, best Mela I've ever been to. Um, I, this is my fourth year coming here and I always enjoy it. There's good vibes. We see a lot of Africa here. There's Ghana, there's uh, Tanzania. There's so many African states that have come and you know people are enjoying the music a lot. So it would be wonderful as well for us to bring South African dancers this coming year. Otherwise it's wow, it's vibrant. I love it. The main motto behind this festival is to promote handicrafts and handlooms with the aid of craftsmen invited from all over the country. In the sheer ruler ambience, it appeals to come and get exposed to some great talents involved in paintings, woodstock, pottery and terracotta and Afghan jewellery, all highlighting the vibrant cultural range of their native places. This is the first time I came here to this exhibition and uh, is proud of us that uh, I'm the only woman that uh, attended to this exhibition and this is the first year for us. Uh, and I think this exhibition is very good, uh, not only for Afghanistan, for all, all uh, countries, because all of the countries come together. And I meet uh, all of the countries, it means not just from Indian people, from everywhere, every corner of the people uh, around the world. Folk songs and dances are an integral part of the fair, and people from all across the world throng here to experience it. Lively recitals by traditional dancers, echoing sounds of drum beats and folk melody, truly the fair displays the rich and diverse culture of India. The Suraj Kund Mela has always been one of the major cultural attractions displaying the richness of Indian as well as foreign culture. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. You're watching Tag TV.